first we have to really think about like what's possible because the the resistance revolution change starts in the imagination welcome to sheeo.world a podcast about redesigning the world i'm your host vicky saunders in each episode you'll hear from sheeo venture founders women who are working on the world's to-do list these innovative business leaders are solving some of the major challenges of our times Please sit back and be prepared to be inspired. Good morning, Lucy. How are you today? I'm really good, Vicky. How are you? Doing well. It's a it's a wild and crazy time in the world, uh, mm-hmm. as we know, um, mm-hmm. and it's been amazing. Uh, kind of weird circumstances to meet you under, like the racial reckoning that's going on, and uh, so delighted and happy to have your voice uh, as part of the racial justice working group and your design brain. Uh, our community is loving this so much. And, and one of the things that I wanted to follow up with you on is the use of language in a lot of things that we're doing. And then, you know, just obviously our actions aligned with language mm-hmm. um, and maybe just a bit of background. Um, so at CEO from the very beginning, we've been um, working towards uh, building new models, new mindsets, so that we can get to a different world, which requires all kinds of decolonizing ourselves, mm-hmm. shifting our thinking. It's uh, obviously deep transformative work. And um, I think a lot of people that step into our community um, are there, oh, this is great because we're dealing with the injustice of uh, women only receiving 2% of venture capital globally. And then it starts to unravel. It's like the why of that is tied into so many deeper things and everything's rooted in the existing structures. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to unpack as you actually get into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so from the beginning, things like, you know, women aren't writing checks to invest and therefore we changed the word that we use for your participation in our community. We don't call you an investor. We call you an activator. And mm-hmm. then people are like, what's that? I'm like, great. Okay. We get to start fresh. <laughs> new behaviors around a new word. Um, and then we don't actually call you a business in our community. We call you a venture because mm-hmm. we're agnostic about the structure you come with. So one of your friends um, who introduced us, Wakumi, mm-hmm. uh, comes into the CEO network with a charity mm-hmm. um, as she's creating new models and solving you know, deep injustices. And so we fund no matter what structure you're in. So there's a lot of, and that's a different kind of thing too. It's like, what? How can you change the world with a charity? I'm like, you can watch, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so we've been very aware of language. And in the last few years, we've really been struggling with this. Uh, um, people use the word diversity. They use the word equity. They mm-hmm. use the word inclusion. And, uh, and then we have some uh, funding that requires us to like identify different racial and ethnic backgrounds. And there's so much about it that just doesn't feel right on our team because we're centering whiteness and everybody else has to check a box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we'll just sort of start here with, uh, you blew my mind with something beautiful uh, when we last talked around, uh, you know, people use the word vulnerable populations or uh, marginalized communities. And you came back and you're like, no, no, no people made vulnerable, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people placed at the margins. Can you talk a little bit about that language piece and what you witness around this in the social justice space? Yeah, Yeah, so in the social justice space, um, the work that we're all trying to do, irrespective of your race and ethnicity and your class, if you come to social justice work, I hope the goal is that you can decenter white supremacy and you could think about all the ways that you participate in white supremacy, you've colluded with white supremacy and how white supremacy has um, socialized you to think about the world in a very specific way, think about yourself, and think about difference. So I am always interested in thinking about in any situation, in any context, um, three things. I'm thinking, how can I disrupt white supremacy, dismantle, or divest from white supremacy? And a really big thing in in regards to like, you're already doing this disruption in regards to the language that CEO is using. And so when we think about um, marginalized communities, 
that when we're when we hear that people are automatically you know we're talking about black people indigenous people afro-indigenous people people of color which are the vast majority of the world globally so how is if the world is globally black indigenous afro-indigenous people of color how is how does that then become the margins the margins of what specifically and so what i like to think about is it's like yes people place at the margins because someone is vying for a center, someone is trying to mass produce a center, they've decided that this is the center and we're gonna push these people to the margins. That's number one. And also people are made vulnerable. I think we forget that poverty, patriarchy, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, these are architect, these are things that are engineered in architect that are codified and upheld by systems, structures, thinkings, laws, you name it. And so there's nothing inherently vulnerable about being or at risk about being an indigenous person or being a black person. The problem is the society that is anti black black anti-indigenous that puts these folks um makes them vulnerable so i think it's really important to in if we're going to disrupt power if we're going to train ourselves to pay attention to all the invisible power that could be in a context we have to name and make present what we're being forced to not see and what we're being forced to not see is all the ways in which communities are being made vulnerable being put at risk and being placed at the margins so for me when i when i remix and 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 push the limits of that language automatically the the person who's listening to me is just like oh you said that differently. What do you mean by that? Exactly. I want you to really think about the fact that like there's nothing inherently deficient about people, quote unquote, who are non-white, even that language. Right. So that language is as if to be hu the default human position becomes whiteness and everyone else has to be qualified. Everyone else has to go through the Hunger Games and qualify for the humanity. And it's just like. I, and I get what that language is trying to do, but that language is also trying to uphold white supremacy at the same time. And so um, I just try to reject. Bell Hook teaches us that language is a place of struggle. How can we be an ethical struggle and principle struggle around our language to think about even how we describe people, how that inadvertently maintains um, the cages that society puts around these communities. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's where I land and whenever we can get and people might think oh you're that's being too creative that's being too whatever yeah because what is asking us to do how do we get the people who fund our 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 ventures to think differently about how they're thinking they're gonna solve the problem exactly yeah I mean I I'm still deeply in a struggle around this uh, personally to to, to share some kind of construct that people can understand the struggle to dismantle this, right? So uh, I did an off the record session last night um, as a test with Australia and New Zealand activators mm. to try and showcase the rules attached to funding mm -hmm. that exist currently and how they keep us the same or they try to keep us the same. Uh, and so it's great, you've got a new model here and then retrofit it into the existing mm -hmm. structures and processes or there's just literally no funding partners which many people in our organization uh, experience because we're multi-solving everything together because it's the only mm -hmm. way to do systems transformation. You can't just do one thing. Women, mm -hmm. oh, it's all women? I'm like, no, it's women working on this world's to-do list with debt that's, did it, you know, and they're like, uh, oh, that's too, that's, that's too big, mm. right? It's too much to solve. But you know what's interesting, Vicky? No one would tell Elon Musk that who just partnered with NASA to, to a private company just partnered with NASA to get astronauts into yeah. the into the act like no one tells men that no one tells white men you're thinking too big you're thinking unconventionally no one says that and so to me it's just like whenever people are thinking about giving money to women and femmes and non-binary people all of a sudden the person giving the money 
all of a sudden becomes the expert, even though the people they're giving the money to are the actual experts. What would it look like to radically think about funding women, femmes, and gender non-conforming people the way we fund white men, which is we write them blank checks and we allow them to be as big, as bold, as zany, as out the box, and and get people um, um, to the moon and back, right? And get people to do, so it's just like, what, what possibilities if people trusted women and femmes and non-binary people to do the same thing? And so this is where we have to like push against. It's just like, we have, first of all, we experience the world in unique ways. Therefore, we have unique ideas of how we can interrupt and how we could disrupt these notions. But no one trusts us enough to just give us the money and let us be the the the, the engineers and the architects of the language, the the metrics, the 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 success stories, this that and a third, and let us just get to the world's to do list. We can't yeah. get to the world's to do list if patriarchy, our power, or um, is standing in our way, always telling us, um, trying to mitigate like how much impact we can have. And it's so to me, it's just like no one tells that to 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 tech dude bros in Silicon right. Valley are anywhere. And they make good things. And a lot of those 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 venture capital, they flounder within one to three years. Oh yeah, they're just there's the success rate is not there. It's all right. Made up, right? They're it's like performs worse than municipal bonds, like right or on average. So there's not even a reality attached to the narrative. Exactly. It's, it's just very PR'd up uh, and makes it sound like it's a thing. So folks are yeah. burning through a lot of money. What would it look yeah. like to give people who are who are who are put at the margins, made vulnerable, given that kind of money to think differently and to do differently? And I'm, I'm, I feel as if we would see a much better success race than what we see in Silicon Valley right now. Well, yeah. And I mean, we have an example of that. We have 68 ventures we funded who are can't get funded in other places uh, who are outperforming. Mm -hmm. any of their peers and we have a lot of data on it over the last five years um but you know the way that we started with this was this is like so classic too okay so uh these are amazing ideas uh and incredible women entrepreneurs who are solving major challenges that are priorities for us starts with there but the way to get people in the door we said you're not getting your money back we literally had to disrupt that so you get you contribute eleven hundred dollars each we crowdfund that together and then we loan it out it's paid back huge pay rack rates, and then it's loaned out again. So we had to literally, in order to disrupt your ability to like come in to try something different, we had to have you not expect to get your money back because then you could actually go on a journey of trying something new without controlling because there's no control because you're not getting it back. Breathe, mm. right? Like I designed it that way. And now people are like, wow, this is amazing. Look at the community here. Look how we're all working together. Look how incredible she's doing. However, if I had done it a normal way, like most other people are doing, which is like create a fund for white women or black women to fund their ventures, uh, the same market mindset mm. exists. Mm -hmm. And so as I see, this is the don't add women in stir thing. I think yes. that's what most people are doing, yes. right? like adding indigenous in stir, adding mm -hmm. women in stir mm -hmm. and, and using exactly the same metrics, the same mindset to fund those ventures is not going to work. No. But I like, how do you, do you have, have you seen people do a good job? You're so articulate on this and I'm still learning this language in a way because I've been, you know, part of this freaking system, struggling through it my whole life, wondering what's wrong with me. Um, and so part of this, like how to frame all of this up front to someone that you want to get into relationship with as a potential funder before you say, here's, instead of leaving with, hey, here's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. as CEO, it's like, here are the things that we can't deal with, right? We, we can't, you know, and you go right. through your list of like, <laughs> you're centering this, we're not that. You're, you know, working for this kind of return. That's not what we're doing. And it's almost like you have to say all the knots up mm -hmm. front. Mm -hmm. And then, are you still with me? Do you want to still talk or are you done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then don't waste my time, right? <laughs> but, like, but it's also words, it's not embodied. So people could nod and say yes, and then turn around and be completely different the next day. Yeah, I think what I try to do is ask adults to really tap into their imagination. Mm -hmm. What do you think is possible? Like, 
Because right now, the world we have is someone's imagination, um, a very white, a very male, a very violent, a very um, colonial settler imagination. And I, what I think in, in I want to ask, because before we can even give people new language, new orientations, new way of being, first we have to really think about like what's possible because the the resistance revolution change starts in the imagination so i want to know are you the kind of person who believes the world we have is the only world we can have we can make some cosmetic changes but that's it or i want to know are you the kind of person who's like actually when no one's around, when you give yourself full permission, I actually do believe these things are possible. And I actually, when I'm quietly washing the dishes or driving the car, walking the dog, I actually have some steps about how I think this particular problem could be solved because I'm really passionate about it. And so what I invite people to is like, let me into your imagination show me what you've been thinking, show me what you're passionate about, tell me what really like keeps you up at night, what what, what really makes you sad. And I want to hear like, do you have any ideas about how you think we can intervene on that? And then from there, I see if this person can easily go to that place, then we can do something. And if that person is a little reluctant, I want to learn What's the reluctance about? What, what, what have you been told as an adult person around imagination? What have you been told as an adult person about freedom, liberation? What have you, how has, has white supremacy so arrested your imagination that you actually think it's dangerous to even think differently inside of your head by yourself? Because I wanna, mm -hmm. I, I wanna know that because so many people, because the most insidious violent thing that white supremacy does is rob us of our imagination. Mm -hmm. And so if we can start there, what's possible? What do you think? What, what, what are you thinking and feeling? And then I can bring you into the material world because everything that has ever become started in someone's imagination from the can opener, from the Tesla, from the, this laptop, our powerful iPhones. Someone gave themselves permission to go there in their mind and brought that into the material world and made that possible. The same way people have come up with eugenics projects, the Holocaust, chattel slavery, that came out of people's imagination. So I want to know where are you in your imagination? Are you, can you radically and boldly be with that? And can my imagination connect with your imagination? And let me give you some language on how we can start to shape this world. And so that to me, is where I think, and I don't think it's hokey. I don't think it's the kind of thing that one can't bring into a very serious business meeting. One can't bring into your family. One can't bring into the classroom. We have got to encourage adults to tap into that space of, of creativity if we're going to do things differently and be different people. Yes, yes, so much so. Uh, imagination in everything in particular, like there is, almost no imagination in finance. That's just like, <laughs> do it the same way over and over, you know? So when we came out 0% interest loan and this perpetual fund, people are like, what is that thing? Mm. You know, that is not in my context. It's like the economy has kind of become a religion. Yes. Uh, and it's, we're like so kind doubled of. down. Yeah, or <laughs> yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, there's this whole transactional uh, piece that's in it instead of a deepened relationship. And so I, I deeply love the world word imagination because this is all made up everything is made up. I, it's, it's one of totally, my slides. Yes, <laughs> it's yeah. totally made up. It's totally made up. And we seem to, uh, certainly in, in North America, we've kind of forgotten history. And so we don't realize that, you know, 400 years ago, there was a fork in the road and we could have gone one way or the other. And we could have had a totally different world. We chose one mm -hmm. philosopher over another. Mm -hmm. And then two, 200 years ago, we chose one philosophy over another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was just a choice in a moment. It has nothing to do with this is the only way. Um, and so that's a, that's a big thing to deconstruct too, right? Mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. And it, then it becomes to this, you know, the existing system we're in has us believe that there is obviously no other way to do this and that we are not powerful because we've been led under peer for this fear for a long time. And so it's been amazing to me to go around the world uh, with this model and see people wake up to the fact that, oh my God, like we literally have everything we need. If we come together, this whole thing is over. Like we can transform anything in, a, in an instant, but we've been so separated uh, and, set, and put into such individualized 
philosophies of mm -hmm. like, what's in it for me? Don't care about my neighbor. Um, and it, it's been fascinating to witness. There are lots of societies around the world where there's deep uh, community mm -hmm. uh, and the difference in how people react to each other in a community based mm -hmm. environment versus not. I mean, it's on display every day now. Mm -hmm. uh, we just see it. I think it's interesting that we're here. We are living through a global pandemic that essentially um, forces us to reckon with the reality like these borders we think we have between us are not real because what happens in one part of the world it might travel slowly but eventually it will reach my doorstep and i too will have to wear a mask i too will have to quarantine i too it doesn't matter where the thing started and so if we know that if capital if there's no borders um um in capital right we're we're in a global demand mm -hmm. i bought a refrigerator a month ago it still has not been delivered because of how covid 19 has disrupted global chains right i'm still waiting for my refrigerator um i still can't have freedom of movement in a very specific kind of way because of COVID-19. So if we know those kinds of things already, why can't we bring that to, to our to our other understandings of the world because we know social media shows us and teach, and she sees me i know what's going on in my own community and simultaneously i know what's going on somewhere else why can't we take that kind of thinking into other aspects of our life these borders are not real and if they're not real, let's dissolve them and let's get to the hard work of building with each other across the globe. Because what ails my sister elsewhere will eventually ail me, especially as North Americans um, and North American women and femmes. There is a way in which we are, unbeknownst to us, not that I purposely did this, but our nation states are responsible for the suffering of, of globally of other women and femmes globally. And so if I know this in a very acute way, what do I do as a citizen in North America sitting on this side of Turtle Island, you're sitting on the other, how do we take seriously that responsibility and how can we make this world better? since borders are not even technically as real and as fixed as we think they are. So there's a lot, there's already a lot of room there to play and think differently. If capital is global, if, 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 if our cultures can be imported and exported, what else can we do? Can our consciousness, can our sisterhood, can our, can our, can our feminism, whatever the thing we, we, that animates us, can that too be global? And, and certainly we've witnessed yes <laughs> to that, <laughs> uh, especially with Zoom, right? Right. The technology that we have. And so it's not getting on a plane anymore. It's not, you, you, we uh, in our community have uh, tomorrow, Canada, the UK, uh, and the US are on a call. Last night, Australia, New Zealand, we travel, you know, around the world to, to meet each other on these calls uh, and deepen relationships and recognize difference and similarities and how we can all help each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and that you're really sort of one step removed from what you need. And it, yeah, the border is just completely gone now mm -hmm. in a way. This is another gift of the pandemic getting us mm -hmm. to recognize how close. I mean, it is not hard to schedule anyone for anything anymore, really, because we're all at home. <laughs> it's like, no, I'll be in, oh, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right? I'm right here. You got me, no problem. Um, yeah, this is fascinating. Okay, can, let me take a little turn for a mm -hmm, sec. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to go to this word, which is so used these days, and I feel in, it's uh, what is the root of intersectionality, <laughs> uh, and what what does intersectionality mean to you? I hear it thrown around an awful lot. Uh, I think it's absolutely critical because it's it's a anyway. Over to you, intersectionality. Okay. So intersectionality is um, is a is a gift we were given from black feminist thought so when enslaved africans were trafficked and stolen and brought to the americas um we have a situation in which black women were forced to really think about what does it look like when race intersects with gender and what are the sufferings the new categories of suffering that gets created when those two intersect and so i okay so obviously i'm from the united states um i am i am a 
for real, for real, card carrying, very proud feminist, right? And I like to say, you know, I'm rooted in black feminist thought and my black feminism is very much animated by women of color feminism and indigenous feminisms. And so, which means I don't necessarily, in North America, we tend to talk, think about feminism in terms of waves. I don't actually believe in in, in the concept of feminism in waves because it does um, center whiteness because it, it gives us the impression that the feminist movement in North America didn't start until bourgeois middle class white women decided, oh, perhaps I'm oppressed, perhaps I should have the vote. And in 1492, when, when Christopher Columbus comes to Turtle Island, um, indigenous women, indigenous folks have been fighting against settler colonialism, which is a very gendered project. And then you have um, enslaved African who, who are brought over to the new world, who are having to think very critically about what does it mean when to have your body um, be taken over essentially by a nation state to being asked to breed and to uphold a dehumanizing system like what does it mean to think about your body and yourself in that way and so so I, I think it's really important to start there because intersectionality has always existed we have in 1840 I believe or 1804 I'm really bad with numbers I I will like mix them up we have Sojourner Truth who gives a talk at Seneca Falls during a um a, a, a women's movement, a women's um, um, gathering, and she's talking about, well, ain't I a woman, right? Because in that moment, you have these bourgeois white women talking about all of these things, and she's like, hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm a woman. I've had children. I've been enslaved. How come these these sensibilities that we were thinking about women and womanhood is does not apply to people like me who look like me and who are in my conditions? So intersectionality is something that Black women have been theorizing about for the past 180 years. So it's gone from ain't I a woman, it's gone from double jeopardy, that concept, intersecting oppressions. And then in the 1980s, Kimberly Crenshaw, a Black legal scholar, coins the term intersectionality. Essentially, it means when we think about all the social categories, race, class, gender, ability status, citizenship, nationalism, you name it, when they intersect with each other, for certain bodies, it creates new forms of suffering and oppression. So intersectionally ask us to think about what are the different powers at play that is making this person more vulnerable, being put at risk, right? And so, so literally, that's it. How do systems come together and create new forms of suffering? Because again, we're never just talking about race. We're never just talking about gender. We're never just talking about class. These things are not distinct by themselves. They are animated by one another. And so we have to think about how do we look at that? So again, when a white woman um, is thinking about um, there's a way in which white women, if, if that white woman is practicing hegemonic white feminism, um, they're thinking, they're just thinking about gender, 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 gender. How is my gender being impacted in this situation? However, comma, for those of us who do not have racial privilege, we're always thinking about how is my race interacting with my gender expression? Um, what's going on with my citizenship? Is there a class dynamic here? Is there all those kind of things? So literally, how do we pay attention and train ourselves to think about the simultaneity of these different social categories? And so I understand why some feminists say they want to, they call themselves intersectional feminists. Feminism is not an I, is not an identity. It is an analytical tool. It is a way of looking at power. I get it. Like some people, they want, they want to signal and virtue and want to signal that, oh, I am an anti-racist feminist. I'm thinking of um, um, my feminism um, honors trans people, gender non-conforming people. We don't have to use that word in that way. There's no such thing as an intersectional feminist. It's an analytical tool. How do we use this tool to analyze what's going on? Because that tool allows us to think about who are we centering right now? Mm -hmm. And how can we um, make whatever programming, whatever venture, whatever activation, whatever thing that we're building, who are we centering? And what are all the things we have to take seriously um, if we're going to center these particular people, this particular identity to ensure that 
um, this program benefits them the most because if we can if we can center people at the most who are made mar who are put at the margin it makes whatever we're building better for everyone so design theory says when um people create something for left-handed people it ends up really being that much more better for right-handed folks why because you you decentered the starting point and it made whatever you were creating better for everyone else even those who are dominant and so that is what intersectionality forces us to think about it's not an identity it's um it's really important it's a tool that all feminists should use but we should never forget that black feminism is what gave us that because of what black feminists had to survive under chattel slavery and the beautiful thing about intersectionality is like once you understand the groundwork of it we, we can take an international approach it can be used it does travel to other places and other cultures but we don't we could still be um, be faithful to its starting point. We don't have to obscure and erase Black people, Black women at the center to make it more internationalist. So um, that is something I'm really, really passionate about because this is the thing that, that, it, this thing already exists, has already been gifted to us by Black feminist thinkers to disrupt and think about power differently. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's very, that's fascinating because I feel like uh, as you're sharing that and taking us on a journey through um, where it's evolved, for me, intersectionality is kind of the doorway mm -hmm. to help us think about, like, even when I think about the world's to-do list, people have it all decontextualized, 17 different goals, all uh -huh. separated, pulled out from each other, but it's actually the power is in the relationships mm. between things, mm. which is the intersectionality of it. Exactly. So you're using an intersectional lens to think about the world's to-do list because you understand these 17 things impact each other. There's no way to solve one thing and isolate this one thing. And then, okay, when we're done with this one thing, we'll get to number two, we'll get to number three, we're gonna get to number four. No, people who are living at these intersecting oppression, that is not how we experience oppression. In this moment, when I walk into some place and someone treats me wrong, I can't be like, oh, it's because I'm black. Oh, it's because I'm a woman. Oh, maybe they think I'm, they can um, sense that I'm queer. No, in that moment, it's all of those things interacting mm -hmm. um, together. And so if, if, my, if my oppression and subjugation is, is, is being experienced that way, the problem solving also has to mirror that. Right, which is, and like deconstruct that. It's insane. Yes, yes, <laughs> right? Yes, yes, It's just yes. like all entangled. Everything's mm -hmm. entangled. Uh, and I think this, this is just a fascinating uh, challenge because we've, uh, everything has gotten so complex. Everything mm -hmm. is interconnected and interdependent. Nothing can be pulled out and not influence the whole. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, when, when I started to, I've been thinking about this for 25 years, this sort of model that we've come up with with CEO, like trying all different angles and experimenting. And it's, you have to do, um, get capital into women's hands. You have to like create some kind of uh, environment where it's different. So we call it radical generosity. And you come mm -hmm. in with a different way of being with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we look at um, what is the power with instead of power over. And mm -hmm. so uh, every single person who contributes capital has one vote. It's no expert in finance decides over some a grandmother of a 14 year old who maybe doesn't have the financial chops, but it's the collective intelligence that does it. And then it's being in right relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's then the commitment to transform yourself because you have no control over these ventures. You show up and you support them on their own terms. Like all these pieces and people are like, Oh my God, like, aren't we just funding <laughs> women? Can, can I just write a check? Like, why do you have to tell me all this stuff? It's like way too much. Um, but, and I was kind of hoping we could just do that right? There's underneath this model is a ton mm. of intention and design that's very intersectional. And to un, like to literally unweave that for everybody and show all of the initial, I've been like, it's just too much for people's brains. Yes. And now I'm like, no, we have to do it. Like it's yeah. the only way to get where we need to go. We have to deeply, like we have to go deep into ourselves to embody all these things. Because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise you can participate but if you're not embodying it, it shows up fast. Someone's mm -hmm. grumpy to somebody else. Someone tries to put control over someone because they don't like what they're doing. Like you have to actually expose all of this stuff or interrogate it maybe to your, use some of your words. Um, yeah, it's interesting. 
yeah, we do have to, we do have to interrogate because the, um, the systems that got us to this place is also complex. Mm-hmm. So if we think we're going to intervene patriarchy and how patriarchy dictates how women, femmes, and gender expansive people get funded or become leaders, we're going to have to have a, have a complex set of problem solving tools to intervene against that. And so although it looks like there's not a lot of thought because these power structures have been up for so long. So it just looks like, you know, we don't even see how all the hands that are upholding them, but those, those systems are equally as complex. Mm -hmm. And so we have to meet that complexity with our own level of complexity to, if we're going to flatten power, if we're going to make this more circular, and if we're going to divest from the hierarchies and, and treating different as, if it's a, a deficiency and so i just think what w- the difference is there's other people making those complex white supremacist decisions for you and what you're inviting people to do here is just like no 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 the power is in your hand it's like the wizard of oz it's you there's no wizard <laughs> you know you had it all along you just now have to now that you have it you have to think about well what are you going to do with this power how are you going to shape it how are you going to be with it in a way that's radically different from from the blueprint you've been given and mm-hmm. so as north americans because we love our easy um we love to outsource source everything if possible now we're asking people no 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 you're not going to outsource that there's no app for that you actually have to be mindful and present and you have to ask yourself okay self what am I going to do different am I going to go right or am I going to go left and so which is um that's a hard orientation for we North Americans to get back into because you know if it can be outsourced we will do that if there's an app for that I will pay the exorbitant amount of service fees just so I can avoid doing that thing right <laughs> totally oh absolutely and I I mean it is interesting too that this is seems to be really rising up uh, during the pandemic, right? Racial reckoning, all of these things, the curtains being pulled back mm-hmm. and unveiling everything. And we have time. Yeah. Right. We are not overscheduled like normal, or maybe some mm-hmm. people are, um, mm-hmm. but we have time to actually do that mm-hmm. and to show up mm-hmm. uh, and to our moment of technology that allows us to connect with those who have it. Uh, that's still a big issue in some places. And so, um, as we are working through this, one of the challenges that we've uh, been having is, um, so I talked to you about this a little bit before, uh, mm-hmm. naming naming mm-hmm. all of the identities. And I'm like, <laughs> I've got my hands all like lined up, right? Uh, naming all of the identities to, in order to really, you know, articulate everyone is welcome or he, these these groups are welcome here. So you have interesting language around this. And each time I talk to you, I feel like you're using different words too. Uh, Because we're evolving, right? Yes. Language. Each week you're like, oh, okay, I'm not going to say that anymore. I'm changing it to this. And I think last week you said, don't say BIPOC, say Black, Indigenous, Afro-Indigenous, people of color. And then at the end of the sentence you said, this week. (laughs) And I laughed and I thought, okay, so get your editing pen out. Like you're changing. As you learn more, as you pay more attention to things, right? We're adding to these. And so this, I thought you had such a great line. You're like, be specific Mm -hmm. without homogenizing. Mm -hmm. I really love that. Yeah, it's really important for us to be specific without homogenizing. So BIPOC, people of color, beautiful terms when we're thinking about spaces, right? But when we're thinking about if I'm writing a white paper, if I'm writing something specific, if I'm writing a report for someone, I think in those spaces, it is just better to think about, well, who who does this thing that I'm talking about, what identities does it seek to center? And for me, um, um, BIPOC doesn't quite land for me. Now, for some people, they love it. It works really well. But as I'm thinking about it, especially from, from a North American context, there is a way sometimes we like to do is like Black people over here, Indigenous people over here. And I sometimes I think BIPOC is inadvertently making making it seem like there's a border between those two and mm. forgetting that there are first of all 
there are indigenous people wherever there have been people, right? And right now we, we're just talking about indigenous folks uh, to North America, but like black people are indigenous to a place. There are all sorts of indigenous people. So just even our concept of indigeneity, um, we have to be really careful that we're not like, we're, when we think of indigeneity, that we're not only thinking about one kind of person, one kind of body. So that's number one. Number two, forgetting that, especially like I'm here in South Florida, the Seminole tribe um, came to be of indigenous people partnering with black folk and so that is how that tribe came to be so that's really powerful so right there there's no border there's no fixed border between black people and indigenous people in that way and so for me i think bipoc um i see what it's trying to do but it misses but what if you're afro-indigenous what about those people and so for me when i'm thinking how do I think, okay, I'm thinking about Black people, Indigenous people, Afro-Indigenous people, and people of color. For me, it's not a sexy acronym, right? But it works for me because I'm not actually trying to be sexy or efficient in my language. What I'm trying to be is effective. And what I'm trying to be is clear in my language. And this is where I would say my ancestral mentor, Audre Lorde, becomes really important in this way it's just like um thinking about how do we talk about difference in a way that doesn't ask any one group to obscure themselves or make themselves smaller for mm. our benefit whatever that benefit is and so in a world of acronyms in the world of efficiency in the world of we're trying to get fit everything within these characters I am actually rejecting the impulse to cut corners and I'm actually, okay, let's list the people out, let's list the identities, comma, 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 because that's important. And that is how I be in, that is how I ensure that I keep myself honest and engage in a feminist ethic of who do I mean? Who am I talking to? And again, intersectionality does ask us to be specific. When we're talking about colonialism, we're talking about colonialism. When we're talking about nationalism, we're talking about nationalism. When we're talking about race, we're talking about race. When we're talking about class, we're like, I, we can't use these words as umbrella terms and switch them out when we want because it actually causes harm. We need to be we need to be clear about what is the harm that we're talking to? What's the thing that we're trying to disrupt? Who are the people that we're trying to center in those kinds of ways? And so for me, um, that's important to my feminist ethic. Like I said, like I can't, I, I'm not, I, I don't have no alternative acronym to BIPOC, but what I do have is who are we talking about? Like, even when we're talking about LGBTQIA, right? Which is, I sometimes I get a little annoyed when um, that's being spoken about because if you're talking about gay men, you're talking about lesbians, or if you're talking about cis queer folks, just say that. Because there are times when we're only talking about cis queer folks and people will haphazardly throw in the tea, but we're actually not talking about the tea. We're actually not talking about that. So if we're fancy people with our fancy English language, fancy degrees and everything, let's take the time to be clear. Who and what are we talking about? And so I, in the, this, the pandemic has been forcing me to really slow down and be like, wait, 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 see, this is internet speak. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. And how right. do I move away from internet speak and really be clear about ethically, who am I talking about? What am I talking about? What's my goal and ob ob objective here? And let's get clear. And what language do I need to use? And if there's no fancy acronym, that's fine. Just use the words that, that, that we whatever. And can I bring other ideas to animate the thing that I'm trying to say to get my reader to understand where my impulse, where my intellectual impulse is coming from? So that's my long answer. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite fascinating because you're clearly, you know, deeply uh, in the work of all of these words. This is your, your academic background, right? I mean, so you, right. you really have a deep, deep uh, rooting in it. And as we were starting to talk more about women, gender expansive, uh, gender non-binary being welcome to apply at she like who's welcome to apply at mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. um and so we started to we've been working on the, the language and what we want to say uh 
and it's been evolving over the last couple of years. And so we, um, we put this out to one of the countries that just had uh, voting and we said cis trans I, I can't remember exactly all of the pieces that we used and because I'm still working on all this in my brain and one of the one of the women wrote back and said uh, I don't know what cis is are, are women allowed to apply like in her term right now and it was just it's one of these things like there's this, these terms are so new for so many people too yeah. and depending on where you are in the world this yeah. is just not a conversation exactly right? yeah. and so that as okay so i'm glad that you say that because i am obviously operating in a very particular kind of bubble i'm constant for the most part i'm i am talking to people who have a very social justice orientation um people in academia whether it be a student or professors this that and a third and so there is a way I get socialized to speak and just throw out this jargon. And even in those terms, even when I use um, um, uh, the acronym, in the uh, I know that those people are going to do the intellectual heavy work and deconstruct that. Right. But actually, what about everyone else who's not in that bubble? How do I get them to understand what I'm talking about? And so that is why I'm trying to move away from these things because ideas travel, like my ideas in a very specific way and the reach I'm having on the internet is traveling. And I want people, yes, people can Google, but like if you don't have the proper structures and frameworks, um, Googling might create more of a mess, not, not make less of a mess. And so- yeah. To me, it's just like I'm thinking about how can my language be more inviting to everyone and to be more democratized? Like you didn't have to, you don't have to be part of the fancy schmancy social justice in crowd to understand what I'm talking about, because what I'm talking about is way more important than the acronyms and those kind of things. And so how do we remember that there are still so many people to invite into this way of thinking, into this way of being, and if language is going to be their first reception and their and their welcome we need to do a lot of work around how clear is this language yeah yeah i mean and, and that's a real struggle with us we have people ages 14 to 96 uh like just a total range of age stage experience background uh and we're always uh i mean on our venture applications our big thing is you know only 10 questions no pitch decks no jargon uh, and no attachments and people. And so you have to speak from the heart about what you're doing. Oh my God, that sounds using, so hard. <laughs> it is, it is. Well, exactly, that's the point, right? Like literally no jargon. So someone has to understand what you're saying no matter where they're coming from. And that's really tough to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, you know, people go cut and paste their bio or use, you know, my go-to-market strategies, blah, blah, blah. And people are like, what's that? I don't know what that means. Uh, and so you don't get voted for mm -hmm. if you come in with that. And if you're deeply understandable and you can, you know, how do you make money? Mm -hmm. Who are you in the world? And why are you the person to solve this problem? If you can say that in a, like a deeply moving way, you get voted for. Mm. And if you're like, la, 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 all in your head, not embodied, you're toast, you know, and you may have the best business idea in the world, but like, Hey, if you can't communicate that, it doesn't work here. It's interesting. Right. Right. If you could only communicate it to your in group. Yeah. Um, what, how does that serve the overall project? And I think sometimes for those of us who are very justice oriented, yes, our language is beautiful and it does speak, our language is powerful and sometimes, um, it creates, it doesn't create more opening for more people to want to come in and join us in this radical imagination and thinking about the world differently. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like, personally, I'm sitting here thinking, man, like, I better not say the wrong word, like a little bit, right? I have a bit uh -huh. of that in me, and uh -huh. I, because there's there's a lot more learning I need to uh -huh. do to understand the the soup I'm living in for sure, uh -huh. and uh -huh. I live in the imagination side. Mm -hmm. Like, I can dream up new shit every single day. That's what I do. I love coming up, and I don't think in a traditional way, but I don't have the words for what those things are. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so I'm, I'm like, oh, Lizzie's giving me a whole new dictionary. I'm really learning different <laughs> words. Like, I, I just this phrase of like, you know, decolonization, decolonization is not a metaphor, you said to me last mm -hmm. week. And I like deconstructed the crap out of that, trying to understand what that meant. Mm -hmm. Right. It didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't flow to me immediately into a, oh, yeah, I get that. Mm -hmm. I just think mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. And what does she mean by metaphor? And what does she mean by, you know, mm -hmm. it's because uh, it's a, it is to your point, it's this, it's a, we're living in different bubbles. Yeah. And how do we, yeah. And so, so if we know 
we live in a very interdependent world. There are not a lot of borders. Borders are not real and fixed the way we think. What does it look like that even when I'm using all of these different words, how can I, how can we set up a parameter that we can be in right relationship with each other, that mm. even if you did use the wrong word, I would just be like, no, no, Vicky, not that word, but this word, or let's think right. about it differently. Let's do, 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 do those kind of things. It's like, how do we change, like, I guess what I'm trying to say, we've all been socialized in this white supremacist world. I am a little maybe far ahead on my journey that doesn't mean i'm not constantly um having to deconstruct and the reason why i if you talk to me week to week month to month you might hear sh different shifting is because i'm taking seriously i am in a in a practice of self-reflecting about am i clear am i as clear as i can be right now in this moment right and so because i understand how deeply i am swimming in the waters of white supremacy and how that's dictated my language however in thinking about how i want my language to be open and clear i also want to think about how do i invite people to ask actually ask me questions it's like you use this word why why are you why you use this phrase like oh, i've never heard that phrase what do you think and feel about that phrase not that i'm trying to create some difference or hierarchy or like i'm over here you're over here i actually want people to do mental gymnastics when they're talking to me so that i leave impressions upon them so that they're thinking about things differently and i do want people to be like lucy girl what are you talking about what do you mean by that and because um because we're building so if we're going to build a new world i have you have to in, you have to ask me your imagination invite me into your imagination and i'll invite you into mine invite me into your lexicon and i'll invite you into my and let's see what can we make together because i don't because that's that, that's a that's the hard thing about this social justice thing because for some of us who are a little bit more adept at this language I'm not trying to create a distance between myself and my audience and my and the people I want to build with. I genuinely want to build with people. And how do we all call on our courage to be like, I don't understand that word you just used because no matter how clear I'm trying to be, I'm also like operating from here. I don't know what's clear for other people. And so I hope we all can like really call on our courage to ask people this, your language in this moment is probably creating a border when you're probably trying to create a bridge i want to i want people to be like girl let the bridge down like right. explain that a little bit more for me because i don't want to be creating i don't want to recreate these borders with like this because again i as someone who's getting closer and um to becoming dr sagu i'm not really interested in being that pretentious and that ridiculous right. <laughs> yeah well and for me like this is the underlying piece of this concept of radical generosity that we have at CEO, like if you assume, like mm -hmm. when you come into our network, you're signing on to practice that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if, if we are in relationship together mm -hmm. uh, in the spirit of radical generosity, I feel way safer saying stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so that's, yeah. that's the thinking underneath uh, the philosophy that we use. And so, and you're used the word, which is absolutely the beautiful word courage. Yeah. Yeah. You know, know that it's like if you step into that, you will be deeply rewarded in a deeper relationship with Lucy. Yes. Uh, learning yes. more about mm -hmm. our intersectionality and how we can together uh, ripple that out mm -hmm. to our, the collective communities that we're working with and have a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, tr like every day, I do exactly the same thing. It's why I noticed with you, the changing of words is like, last week you said this and we, our one-liner changed again. Did, did we just change our one-liner, Saunders? What are you doing? Uh, because I'm noted, I'm putting it out there to see what gets impact. What comes yeah, back. Exactly. Where, does, where do I get a feedback loop? Oh, okay, that's resonating. That thing isn't, like mm -hmm. it's just not resonating. Mm -hmm. And which is why the change of it, because it's about the transformation. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. it's about understanding. All mm -hmm. of this is about the transformation and understanding and getting into relationship. And if people aren't resonating, you have to shift yourself, shift your language, try and figure out what that is to unlock uh, that deeper relationship. I mean, that for me is everything. It's like if we can get into deep relationship and we can create these spaces that, you know, radically generous spaces I'll use instead of stake, because I know that's not a word that works for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Then we can actually show up a little bit differently yes there's permission to actually bring out the imagination that isn't mm -hmm. safe to say sometimes mm -hmm. or bring out the question mark 
I had no idea what you just said. Um, but yeah, it requires, it requires some relationship building. This is our second call. I'm like into you. <laughs> I'm like really, I'm, I'm really, I'm stretched in our conversations, which I really love. Yeah. Um, and I, it leaves me with lots of questions yeah. and it leaves me with lots of things to explore. Well, I mean, that's why I'm the social justice doula, right? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm re- literally trying to doula folks into um, new ways and um, being transformed. And again, whenever I can be in these conversations, it forces me to be like, huh, before I pick up this word, is this the most clear I can be is mm-hmm. in this moment? Um, because again, I'm married to my transformation and my evolution, not my ideas. Ideas mm-hmm. come and go. And if I am a really... Um, if I'm serious about engaging with active learning, um, ideas are supposed to come and go. So I don't take it personally when an idea I had last week has outgrown itself this week. I don't take that personally at all. Um, So I'm okay with letting stuff go and trying on new things and, and practicing new ways of being. Like, I'm totally okay with that. Awesome. Okay. Well, on that note, to be continued, (laughs) thank you so much. This was awesome. Uh, It's amazing. How can people find you? Um, You can find me on lutzisagu.com. You can find me at the social justice doula on Instagram. I am pretty much any and everywhere on the internet. You can follow my public um, stuff on Facebook under Lutzi Segu. That's L-U-T-Z-E-S-E-G-U. Um, I'm pretty accessible. So find me um, and let's talk and let's learn together and let's unlearn together. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lutzi. Thank you for listening to the CEO.world podcast. If this conversation resonated with you, please share it with a friend and subscribe on your favorite podcast player. If you'd like more information about CEO, please visit our website at CEO.world. That's S-H-E-E-O dot world.